Well, it's anniversary time, and this is the 26th year of this fine church and congregation. What you see now was not what this church started with 26 years ago. And so for us not only to have not only lived and survived, but also thrived, there's a glorious testimony. To God be the gr glory for great things he has done. It's a season of rebranding and a season of rebuilding and reemergence in the community. And we thank the Lord for the privilege he's given unto us to be here with you today. I do bring greetings from our local church, Raymond Christian Center in Columbus, Ohio. And we bring greetings to you on behalf of its membership and its eldership and leadership, as well as bringing greetings to you on behalf of our network of local churches. Amen. Churches across the world that believe in covenant relationship and building and expanding the kingdom of God with a spirit of excellence. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And would you celebrate uh, Apostle and Dr. Uh, Johnson for 26 years of service to this church. Amen. Amen. I just want to celebrate that tonight. Amen in Jesus' name. Thank you for your service in the name of Jesus. Good, good, good. I like to celebrate people that are doing something. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Good. Well, tonight as we begin our time together, let's begin our time together and let's find uh, a little uh, uh, passage of Scripture in Matthew 13 and we'll get right into what the Lord has for us tonight. If you will, last night we talked about moving into greatness and one of the questions I have to raise is if, in, if God calls us to move into greatness, why is it that so many people live mediocre lives? Why is that people hit a roadblock that I call the status quo and just don't move into everything that God has called them to? Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44, there's a little passage of scripture which is a parable of the kingdom of God. One of the core messages of Jesus when he preached was the message of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the basilea, uh, the word kingdom is uh, the king's domain. Uh, the word kingdom in English is two compressed words, compound words, king's domain that we call kingdom. The word basilea, kingdom, involves the realm of the king, also his territory, his subjects, and his authority, the kingdom of God. Two terms are used interchangeably, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven the core theme of Jesus' preaching. The kingdom of God describes who the kingdom belongs to. It is God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come, my kingdom goes. And so it is God's kingdom, and we pray, thy kingdom come. He says, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's also called the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is where the kingdom is from. It's from heaven. The word heaven is the word oranos. It speaks of the realm of God, the spirit of God. It speaks of the habitation of God, heaven. So heaven is where the kingdom is from. God is the one that owns the kingdom. Why the kingdom of God? Because we need a new community to dwell in because the current community that we dwell in is corrupt. And so the kingdom of God, though we are in community, in any geographical location, God invades those geographical locations with a brand new community called the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Some theologians would argue the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. They would say that the kingdom of heaven is God's eternal kingdom already in existence where God calls things that be not as though they were. The kingdom of heaven is God's pre-existent kingdom, the kingdom that was, that is, and that is to come. It's the kingdom where God sees things as finished even though they haven't even begun. It's the realm of the spirit where there is no time. So when God speaks a thing, it's already declared like it was so. Like with Abraham, he says, I've already called you the father of many nations. Even before he had had one seed. And so the kingdom of heaven can be God's eternal kingdom that is expansive and eternal where there is no time clock. The kingdom of God, they would say, would be limited then. 
to that which is being done and revealed in the earth, and that it is an emerging kingdom. Some would say that the kingdom of heaven is an eternal entity, or I'm sorry, a future entity. And that is, is a kingdom that is coming way down the road somewhere. And some would believe that the kingdom of God was prophesied by the prophets, established by Jesus, preached by the apostles, and now is emerging into the earth. And when Jesus comes, we will experience the ultimate kingdom. In Matthew 13 and verse number 44, we find a little scripture that says this, as Jesus begins to teach various metaphors and analogies and similes about the kingdom of God. And in 1344, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth it, and for the joy thereof selleth all that he hath, and he buys the field. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hid in the field. I want you to understand that when we think about hidden treasure, which is why a lot of people never come into the place that God has called them to. People get dropped in life. They get dropped for various reasons. And when people get dropped, they lose their uniqueness and they never come into all that God has called them to be great. And friends, one of the things that he describes is that lost people are like treasure in the field. Now understand my journey. When I first started preaching, I was brought up in a Baptist church, the National Baptist Church. And when I thought about lost people, I thought about sinners going to hell. In fact, we were taught in the Baptist church I came from to preach hell so hot nobody wanted to go. Uh, it was not uncommon at least once a quarter to have a go to hell Sunday where the preacher preached about hell so tough that nobody wanted to go to hell. And when he got finished preaching, even if you were saved, you came down to the altar to rededicate your life because you did not want to go to hell. And after the first quarter, you would come and re rededicate your life because you didn't want to go to hell. All we knew was we were saved and life now is sweet and my joy is complete because I'm saved, saved, saved. I was saved from hellfire and brimstone. I wasn't going to go down. I wasn't going to go into darkness. I wasn't going to go into the lake of fire. I wasn't going to be with demons and the devil and all the wicked dead for eternity and then be thrown into the lake of fire. I had eternal life and I wasn't going to hell. And when I preached hell, I could preach it and make even saved people feel lost. And friends, we saw lost people as just sinners going to hell. And for the first maybe decade of my preaching, that's the way I saw people who were lost. Then God said, let me give you another picture of lost people. And one day he showed me sheep that had left the sheepfold and they were wandering around wow. and they were victimized and they were prey to the wolf, the bear, the lion, and the snake. They were sheep that had gone astray and they had no protection. They could not run fast. They had no claws to fight off the enemy. They had no teeth to bite the enemy. And they were subject to the wolf, the bear, the lion, as well as the snake. They had wolves that were hunting in packs to tear up their lives. They had lions that would just come in and roar with their mouth and paralyze them. They had bears that sometimes they would invite in their houses and shack up with them and they would tear up their house. Yeah, some of y'all had some bears in your house. They had snakes that would do two things. Snakes can either kill you by what comes out of their mouth or they can squeeze you to death. So there are both vipers and there are constrictors. And friends, you got to watch the people that come into your life because some people will kill you by what comes out of their mouth and some people will squeeze every bit of potential and resource out of your life. So I saw sheep going astray, subject to the wolf, the bear, the lion, and the snake. And my task in saving lost people was to tell them all we like sheep have gone astray. We have been carried away unto our own way. But the Lord sent the good shepherd and has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I saw lost people as lost sheep. In this season of my life, 
Though I know sinners to be lost sinners in the hand of an angry God on their way to hell, though I know sinners to be lost sheep subject to the wolf, the bear, the lion, and the snake, today I see lost people as lost treasure in the field. It's helped me to have a different view of people. Because you see, a treasure is something that is, has worth, it has value, it is something that is rare and it is precious. And when I see lost people, I don't so much see them as lost sinners that stink and are nasty. I don't just see them as sheep that have no sense and have wandered away, but I see them as someone that is precious, someone that is rare, someone that has worth and someone has, has value. Jesus said that the kingdom of God that's within us is like a man that's walking through the field. And while he's walking to the field, all of a sudden he kicks something. And when he kicks it, he stoops down and he finds this is a treasure that's been hidden in the field. It may be a treasure that's been buried because somebody didn't want anybody to discover that treasure. It may be a treasure that through carelessness was lost and dropped in the field. Nonetheless, this treasure that is rare and costly and valuable and has worth has been lost in the field. This person finds this treasure by happenstance in the field, and the treasure is worth so much, it's worth them paying whatever price is necessary. The parable in 1344 says, they sell everything that they have and go and purchase the field to buy the treasure that's within it. There's treasure in the field. Now, Jesus describes the field threefold. The field could be the treasure of your heart. The field could also be the world that we live in. And the field could also be that segment of our heart where God has made great investment in. I believe that, the, that there's treasure in the field of Atlanta, Georgia. Treasure that someone needs to move outside of the sanctuary and walk through Atlanta, and instead of just making jokes and talking about how bad, about how bad people are, that there is treasure in the field of Atlanta that we need to trip over and say, that's treasure. That is treasure that God has called, has worth and has value and is rare and is precious. And he wants us to dig it up, clean it off, and present it faultless before him. You see, many times when we want to move into greatness, we have to ask the question, where are lost people? Where are lost people? Where are lost people? Lost people are around us, but sometimes they are ignored and denied and not interacted with because of the picture that we have from them. Somehow, saints believe that sin is contagious and holiness is not. And sometimes saints believe, I have to do world separation, but Jesus told us to do world penetration. And so many of us think to maintain our salvation, we have to separate us from ourselves from the world. In fact, many of us know the scripture, come out from among them and be separate. And many of us have separated ourselves so much from the world, we're missing the treasure that's all around us. You see, when God saved you that was just sung, he saw something worth saving. You see, in God's economy and in God's thought, you have worth. Would you just kind of shove your neighbor and tell him, listen, I have worth. Go ahead and tell him. Go ahead and tell them I have value. Go ahead and tell them that I am rare and tell them I am precious. Now look at the one on the other side and tell them I have worth, I have value, I am rare, and I am precious. Now go ahead and leak this out to them, tell them I am treasure. So tell them handle me like treasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of us are treasure. We have worth. We have value. Listen, we are precious. We are rare. We are treasure. And God wants us to handle people like treasure. Now, friends, why is treasure buried in the field of Atlanta? And why are there so many people walking around our city who are lost and don't know their way? Friends, I believe it's because some people never answer some major questions in their life. 
And tonight I'd like to cover where are lost people. And the lost people usually are behind these five questions. First of all, who am I? If I never answer the question, who I am, I can never come into this great salvation we just sung about. Where did I come from? If I don't know my origin, I can never answer that quick question on becoming who I was born to be. Why am I here? That's a question that I need to answer. Because if I don't answer the question of why I'm here, I can wander through life and never really fulfill the purpose I was given. What can I do while I'm here? That's a question of my capacity. What is it that I'm expected to achieve while I am in the earth? And then after death, what? If it's appointed unto man wants to die and after that judgment, then after death, what? Where am I going? Now, where did Jesus encounter lost people? Because Jesus built a great ministry that has lasted for 2,000 years, not just 26, but 2,000 years. Here's what I've discovered. Jesus encountered people in the marketplace and in the ministry space. I went back last year and read through the Gospels and began to do some chronicling and then read some commentaries. And what I found out is that Jesus encountered the majority of the people that he encountered in the marketplace, not in the ministry space. Do you know that Jesus had 120 different appearances through the Gospel in the marketplace and only about 10 appearances in ministry space, temples, tabernacles, and shrines. 120 appearances in the marketplace, only about 10 in ministry space. Do you know that Jesus taught 45 parables out in the marketplace? But he only taught seven parables in ministry space, in tents, in, tabern in tabernacles, in temples, and in shrines. Do you know that Jesus did 39 divine interventions. The gospel records about 39 different miracles. If you include the resurrection and the ascension, 41. But Jesus only did one miracle in a, mir in a ministry space. He went into a ministry space one time and there's a demonized person setting up in a ministry space. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm discerning you right now. <laughs> Go ahead and tell him. In the ministry space, he's found a demonized person. But Jesus did 39 divine interventions that we would call miracles, signs, or wonders outside. Now, here's the challenge that we have to become great. Uh, we look for lost people in the ministry space, but most of the time, Jesus encountered them in the marketplace. And I believe that we must penetrate the ministry space, the marketplace, and listen to this cyberspace. Okay, I heard a moan. Because I didn't come to stroke your halos tonight. I came to provoke you that if we want to get the results that Jesus got, we have to do the things that he did. And what Jesus did was he went into the marketplace where people were. He did not have little, nice, little, neat times like from 11 until 1230 on Sunday morning and say, Jesus, between 11 and 12.30 on Sunday morning, I want to see tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge, and I also want to have discerning of spirits. I want to see faith, miracles, and healings take place. I want to hear in that 90 minutes from the apostle, prophet, advances, pastor, and teacher, I want to see signs and wonders. I want to bring my broke down marriage that's been broke down for 20 years in 90 minutes to the church and let you fix it in 90 minutes. I want you to t save my knucklehead crumb crunching kids. I want you to take all of them that are rebellious and obnoxious that I wonder if these are even my kids because they don't seem to have my DNA. And I want you to totally transform them in this 90 minutes. And then when I go home, we want to be a, a normal, healthy, spiritual, spirit-led family all in 90 minutes in the ministry space. And Jesus, when he encountered lost people, didn't just come to the ministry space. But most of what he did was outside in the marketplace. And I'm telling you, I am provoked that we need to be in the ministry space, in the marketplace, and in cyberspace. Now, why do people get lost though they are treasure in the eyes of God? Not answering five major questions can cause people to be lost. Let's cover the five questions. 
The first question is, who am I? You can write down the word. That's a question of identity. That's a question of identity. And friends, you and I need to know who we are. Now, in your notes, I put down uh, John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 1. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1, it gives us our identity. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, here comes identity. Now you are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what you shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, you shall be like him, for you shall see him as he is. Who I am is a question of my identity. And who the Bible tells me I am is a son of God. Now, why is this important? People get their identity from all kinds of places. Now, I remember at one time in America, we were called niggers. I mean, I'm just speaking a historical word. Okay. And then we morphed from being niggers to being Negroes. And then among our people, we moved from being Negroes to being Afro-Americans. And then we moved from being Afro-Americans uh, or to be black. And then it has swum back so that people could be identified with a continent and with a, a people group, the African diaspora, the spreading forth of African people all over the world. Now the term African-American is fashionable. But that's not only with the African-Americans. There are people that call themselves Irish-Americans. There are people that call themselves French-Americans and Native Americans. But friends, that's not really who you are. Because before there was an America, before there was a France, before there was an Ireland, there was God. And God says, if you want an identity, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Who am I? Somebody yell, son of God. Son of God. Somebody yell, son of God. The next time somebody stops you and says, who are you? Say, I'm a son of God. Now, to be a son of God because we say you're a mighty good father, that means that I have some sonship rights. And that becomes important. I had a man who was in our church and he uh, was out on the internet listening to some rabbi speak. And he came back in and now he told me he's a son of Shem. He's a Hebrew Israelite. He just left our church because of some nonsense he read on the heard on the uh, internet. So he comes into my office and he says, I came to the office, he's dressed in all these Hebraic garments, he's grown dreadlocks and a beard, and he said, I am a black Jew. And then he sat down to me and he said, prove to me I'm not a black Jew. I said, go ask your granddaddy. <laughs> I ain't wasting church time trying to prove to you your genealogy. I don't know your granddaddy. But that lets me know that we have an identity crisis. Everybody say identity crisis. identity crisis. So we try to become everything else because we don't know who we are. And he looked at me and said, that's all you got to say? I said, that's it. It was my shortest appointment of the day. He packed up his Hebrew Bible, his Mishnah, his Torah, and he just walked out. Because God said, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called Ben Elohim, sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Who are you? Who are you? Let's look at a man that was going through some identity crisis. His name is Jacob in the two scriptures I have referenced in your note. In Genesis chapter 21, here's a man named Jacob, and he's born after his brother. They come out about the same time, but one brother comes out a little bit before the next brother. Esau arrives first. Jacob is trying to grab his heel, pull him back into the womb so he can come out first. But, Jacob, but Esau makes it. Listen. Esau, because he comes first, he has the right of the firstborn, the double portion. He's going to get a half of his daddy's inheritance. Everybody else has to split what's left. And listen, Jacob wants the blessing. His father Isaac gets old. 
His father Isaac is getting ready to die. Jacob wants the blessing. Rebecca, his mother, she loves her son Jacob. And she doesn't hate Esau, but she loves Jacob. And she wants Jacob, her beloved son, the baby of the family, to get the blessing. So you know what? Rebecca gets together with Jacob and they forge a plot to steal the blessing. They know that Isaac says, I'm getting ready to die. And he tells Esau, why don't you go hunt, catch some of that venison you know I like, fix it up for me, bring it in, and when I'm eating and when I'm full, I'll give you the blessing. Rebecca goes to Jacob and said, your daddy's getting ready to die, and I want you to get the blessing. So here's what we're going to do. Go down to the flocks, find two young goats, give the goats to me after you kill them and dress them. I know how to make goat taste just like venison. What a cook. He brings the young goats to his mother. She cooks them up. She gives them to Jacob while Esau's still out hunting. Jacob says, if I go into dad, he's going to know it's not me because Esau is hairy. She said, oh, we can fix that. That's what happens when you get your mother involved in your business. She puts some, I talked about that last night. <laughs> she puts some hair on his arm. He goes in, and in chapter 27, verse 18, it says, And he went in to his father and said, My father. And he, that is the father, said, Here am I. Who are you, my son? That's a question of identity. And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your son, your firstborn. He says, I have done just like you told me. Please arise, set, and eat the game. Uh, uh, and eat of my game. He says that your soul may bless me. He's after the blessing. His father rises up, eats, says it is good, rubs his stomach, and then tells Jacob to come over, and he lays his hands on Jacob and blesses him. Jacob then just moves out real quickly, and then all of a sudden Esau comes in. And when Esau comes in, listen, Esau now has the game and he comes in and he says, hey, I have the game that you told me. He said, well, who are you? I'm Esau. He says, I've already given away the blessing. And he gets angry. He said, well, do you not have another blessing? He says, yes, but it's going to be lesser than the blessing I give because once I've given it, I can't take it back. This is called identity theft. Identity theft did not start in the 21st century. You ought to read your Bible sometime. There's some interesting stuff in here. And listen, he steals his identity, and then Esau gets mad. Esau said, I'm going to kill him. He takes on the spirit of Cain, brother killing brother, and he's chasing him through the community. And finally, Jacob runs and finds himself in a land, and he meets a girl whose name is Rachel. She is sharp. He then is introduced by Rachel to her daddy, Laban, and whatever you sow, you shall reap. Laban is a bigger trickster than Jacob. Laban is asked for Rachel's hand in marriage, and Jacob is told, if you work seven years, you can have Rachel. He, what a girl she must have been. He worked seven years to marry this girl, and then on the wedding night, because in that culture you got married at night, the bride was veiled with multiple veils. It was dimly lit, and during the course of the wedding celebration, the bride veiled would slip into a dimly lit tent with her husband, and they would have their first time together. In Laban's culture, the older sister must get married first. The Bible says that her eyes were tender. She was cross-eyed. Now listen, he goes into the tent with the cross-eyed sister. Are y'all with me? GP, are you with me? Okay, now watch it. Listen, listen, he goes into the tent with the cross-eyed sister, wakes up in the morning, and he's got Leah, not Rachel. He goes back to Laban and says, what have you done? 
And he said, well, you know, in my culture, bro, you know, uh, no, no, and nobody's going to marry you anyway because she's cross-eyed. So I had to slip her in on you. Now there's a lot of marriage counseling in that text. Man wanted some so bad he didn't even look at who he was getting some from. Until the morning time, he didn't know. A lot of marital counseling in this text. He wakes up and after he got some down, he don't want her. He goes back and tries to return her to the father, but the father can't take back used goods. Lots of marital counseling in this text. And he says, but I still love Rachel. And he says, okay, work seven more years and you can get Rachel. Instead of going with the cross-eyed sister and getting some, instead of doing that, he works seven more years. When you go into eternity, make sure you meet Rachel. <laughs> 14 years waiting on this man and him 14 years waiting on her. Finally, Jacob gets to the place that he has to run again because now he's tricked Laban out of some livestock. And Jacob in chapter 32, verse 24, he comes to a place where God says, Jacob, I have a destiny for you and you need to come and we need to wrestle tonight. And in 32, 24, it says, and Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched his socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And the man, and he, the man said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's still after the blessing. So he said to him, what is your name? It's another question of identity. And this time he has to remember the last time I was asked, who am I? He said, I'm Esau. But this time, he knows who he is, and he says, I am Jacob. You see, I believe that God has a blessing for you with your name on it. And as long as you and I are pretending that we are someone else, we cannot receive the blessing. God cannot bless you with identity crisis. God cannot bless you when you and I are pretending that we're something that we were not born to be. He said, Jacob. And he said to him, your name will no longer be Jacob. He said, but Esau. No, but I Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said unto him, why is it that you asked about my name and he blessed him there and Jacob called the name of that place Peniel he said because I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved friends lost treasure never comes to greatness and it stays buried because people don't know who they are I talked to so many ministry gifts first they're a preacher then they're a pastor, then they're an apostle, then they're a bishop, then they're an archbishop, then they're a doctor, bishop, apostle. <laughs> and I was on a forum one time in public, and they said, why is it that people have all these titles in front of their name? And I said, because we have identity crisis. Friends, I believe we ought to give honor to whom honor is due. But just for a point of station identification, if you have a lot of accomplishments, choose one to go in front of your name. One pre-nominal designation. An identity crisis will keep us from becoming great and the treasure that we are. We need to not only know who am I, I'm a son of God. But we didn't know where I came from. 
And so this is a question of source. Where did you come from? Genesis 1, 26 simply says this in Genesis 1 and 26. Where did I come from? That's a question of source. It says, and the Lord God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over all the creeping things that creep upon the earth. So watch this. So God created, verse 27, man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish yours to do it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over all the living things that move on the earth. Friends, where did I come from? I came from God. So God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The word make is the word asha. And the word make just simply means to form something from something. There's a part of us that is formed from the earth. We're earthy, says 1 Corinthians 15. And there's a part of us that came from something that God made already. God said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there's a part of you that is earthy. That's called your earth suit. That's the part that man sees. But then in verse number 27, it says, so God created man in his image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created him. There's a part of you that is not Asha, created and formed from something that exists, but it is Asha, bara, and that is ex nihilo. God created you from something that did not exist. He created a part of you from nothing. In fact, that part of you that is Asha, God pulled bara, he pulled out of himself. He made you like him, and God is a spirit. There's a part of you that is eternal, immortal, invisible. It's like God's spirit. And that part of you, God pulled out of himself. Therefore, when you do self-care, there's a part of your self-care that needs to be for Asha. The part of you that is earthy, proper diet, proper exercise, proper exercise, and proper rest. Proper exercise, proper diet, proper rest, that takes care of the asha, the part of you that was created from the earth. But there's another part of you that is bara, made from God, that needs self-care also. That's the part that feeds on the word of God, that feeds on communion with God called prayer, that feeds on that which God has called us to and to be, that feeds on that part of us that connects with him and wants to know him more and more. And friends, you and I, when we talk about self-care, must take care of the inner man as well as the outer man. Don't be a pig with lipstick on it. Don't be all fixed up on the inside, but then being a pig on the outside. And don't be a pig on the inside and then look good on the outside. I've seen a lot of good-looking, trifling people. Because they are messed up on the inside, but they got nice clothes on the outside. And friends, they're fixing up the outside, but they're messed up on the inside. See, where did I come from? I came from God. Who am I? I'm a son of God. Where did I come from? I came from God. Now, how did I come from God? Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Where did I come from? I came from God. Let me tell you what God did when he made us. In Psalm 139, verse 14, he says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Would you look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? And then it says, and a marvelous work of God. Would you push your neighbor and tell him, I'm marvelous? Go ahead and tell him again. Tell him like you believe it. Okay, it says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and a marvelous work of God. Now listen, if you know that you're marvelous, don't let anybody treat you like trash. If you and I know that we are marvelous, let's let people treat us like treasure, not like trash. He says we're a marvelous work of God. Now watch the text, Psalm 139, 14, and that my soul knows right well. He says, I know I'm made, and I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in the marvelous work of God. Verse number 15, it says, my soul, my frame was not hid from you when I was made in secret. It says, skillfully wrought in the lower parts of the earth. When God made you in the body he put you in, he put, gave you the body that pleased him. Some folks, he knew that part of your purpose and destiny, you needed to be tall. Some people, part of your destiny, he knew you needed to be short. 
Some of you are part of your destiny. He knew you needed to be wise. Some of you, part of your destiny was that he knew and he skillfully wrought inside of you. Some of you, part of your destiny is he knew you needed to be quiet. Some of you, part of your destiny, he worked it in you skillfully. He knew you needed to be loud. Somebody ought to say something. I'm going to keep going through my list. Some of you, part of your destiny, God made you a little more introverted so that you kind of process on the inside but when you make a decision, it's usually right because you have gone through all of the scenarios. So you're an introvert, and there's a book, several books written on the power of the introvert. Some of you are extroverted. You let everybody know what you're thinking. <laughs> why, why are you still processing? And so with extroverts, you have to say, now what do we believe today? Because they process out loud, and, and they're very demonstrative. And friends, God skillfully and wonderfully made you. Now watch this. In verse 16, he says, And your eyes saw my substance being unformed. And in your book, they were written, and the days were fashioned for you. Before you and I were born from God, God wrote a book on you. The text says, Every day of your life from birth, to death, he has a plan for every day of your life. So every day when you wake up, God has already predetermined what ought to be going on in your life today. You say, is it that detailed? Every day of my life was fashion. And the goal of life is while I'm walking through life, I get through all the hurt, all the pain, all the dysfunction, all the codependency, and I run into God, and I get acquainted with the one that has the book of life on my life in his hand. And I want to get on, the goal of salvation is get me on the same page with you every day, God. I want to be on the same page with you. Because you see, at the end of the book of the Revelation, when you come, when those people appear before the great white throne, y'all remember that? It says, and the books, plural, were open, and then the book was open, which is the book of life. And it says, and every man's name not written in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. Now, what are the books? The books is when God evaluates people at the end, he's going to say, how much did you live your life every day of your life? on the same page with me. And we're going to be judged out of the books and out of the book. That's why I need to meet my source. Uh-oh, watch out, somebody's in trouble now. Where I can wake up every morning and say, God, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself away. God, help to order my steps. I want to walk where you want me to walk. I want to reach where you want me to reach. I want to say what you want me to say. I want to be on the same page with you. God says all of my days were fashioned before they were, before there was none of them. And in a book, he had it all written down before there was none of them. The psalmist goes on to say, how precious are you also, are your thoughts, O oh God. And it says, how great is the sum of them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Where did you come from? You came from God. And not only does God have a wonderful plan for your life, God has a daily plan for your life. And friends can be lost and never come to greatness because they never tap into their source and they never get on the same page with the God that made them. Why am I here? That's a question of purpose. We hasten the pace now. And it's important for you to know not only who I am, I'm a son of God, where I came from, I came from God. But listen, I need to know why I am here. That's a question of purpose. Fill that in. And a question of purpose is critical because you and I need to know that I'm here with purpose on purpose. I am here with purpose on purpose. Paul put it like this. Paul was a man that was running around fulfilling his own purpose, destroying the church, killing Christians, capturing them, persecuting them. Then God arrested him. And here's what Paul said. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8, 
So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join me, join with me in the sufferings of the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, uh, with a holy life, not because and according to what we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, before time was God ordained purpose for us. Who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? Say this, I'm here with purpose on purpose. Say I'm here with purpose on purpose. I'm going to ask the questions, tell your neighbor. Who are you? I'm going to ask a question. You give the answer to your neighbor. Who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? Turn to the one on the other side. Who are you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? With purpose on purpose. Now, the purpose of the thing is the original intent that a man that a creator had in mind before he made a thing. That's the purpose of a thing. Now, Mouse Moreau gives us some wonderful principles of purpose. First of all, everything has is created with purpose. There is nothing that God creates that there's not a purpose for it. He also says that nothing exists without purpose. So everything that God created, he created nothing by accident. Everything was created on purpose, with purpose. And not every purpose is known. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Everything has purpose. Nothing exists without purpose. Not every purpose is known, and where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. The word abuse means abnormal use. And listen to me. Abnormal use, abnormal use of self and a product and of a person is abuse. Why do people get abused? Because somebody connects with them that doesn't know their purpose. Sometimes you have wife abuse. Spousal abuse, husband abuse, because somebody marries a husband or a wife and they don't know the purpose of a husband or wife. Sometimes you have child abuse because somebody creates children and don't know the purpose of children. Children is abnormal use that's called abuse. And friends, we are here on purpose, with purpose, but every purpose is no. Sometimes people abuse you because they don't know the purpose that God has in your life. Listen to me. I read an article one time on a, new, on a plane, and it talked about the great Oklahoma Roundup. No, it talked about the Great Texas Roundup. And, and what the T Great Texas Roundup was, was Texas was being overrun at one season by rattlesnakes. They were coming into people's home, biting them, making them sick, biting their pets, uh, laying on their driveways, under their cars, getting in their cars and in their garages. So the Texans determined to have what they called the Great Rattlesnake Roundup. They went out and rounded up all these rattlesnakes, got big crates and put them inside of them, and then after gathering them, burned them. And they did it all over the state of Texas. They did this for several years, rounding up these rattlesnakes. And then all of a sudden, the rodent population began to increase. They started having chickmunks and rats and mice all over the place. They did, they came to their ecologists and said, why do we have all these rodents around? They said, well, the natural predator to the rodent is a snake. Y'all got rid of all the snakes. So then they had to go to their arch enemy, Oklahoma, and get rattlesnakes from Oklahoma, bring them into Texas, and release them to reset the ecological balance because somebody didn't know the purpose of a snake. You know everything that God creates, he creates with purpose. There's a purpose for the snake, a purpose for the rat. There's a purpose for a buzzard. There's a purpose for a crow. There's a purpose for a roach. Oh, there's, there's sermons going on around here. <laughs> One of the purposes of a roach is don't have none in your house. <laughs> there's a purpose of everything. Everything has a purpose. There's nothing created without purpose. Everything, uh, every purpose is not known, and where purpose is not known, 
Abuse is inevitable. How important is purpose? And why is it important that you know that you're here with purpose on purpose? Hear me well. Because we know, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good. Listen, that's just not a Christian catch-all statement that we throw on people when tragic things that we don't understand happen. This text says, we know all things work together for good. Two qualifiers, to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you're outside of the love of God, outside of his purpose, you're prey to the wolf, the bear, the lion, and the snake. And stuff can hit your life that ain't going to work out for the good because it wasn't in the plan of God. You see, in the plan of God, no matter what hits your life, everything is God used or God sent. And God somehow is going to turn that thing around. God is able to take the most tragic situation, mix his God factor in it, and turn the thing around. And when you get finished, you say, God, I don't know how you did that, but I'm sure glad that you did. And friends, he's able to work everything together for good to those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. Everything is God sent and God used when it's called according to his purpose. Who am I? I'm a son of God. Who are you? Where did I come from? I came from God. Where did you come from? And why am I here? Why am I here? Why are you here? Now, the next question, as we bring this to a close, what can I do while I'm here? Real simple answer. This is a question of your potential, your capacity. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What can I do while I'm here? Look at your neighbor and say, I can do all things. What can I do while I'm here? Look at your neighbor and say, I can do all things. Listen, you can do all things through Christ, which is the anointing that strengthens you. Christ is the anointing, the presence, and the empowerment of God. And I can do everything that I have been assigned, empowered, and authorized to do. There is nothing that God has called me <coughs> to in my assignment and has empowered me and has authorized me that I cannot do everything. I can do everything that I've been assigned, empowered, and authorized to do. It's a question of potential. I can do all things. Whenever God gives you an assignment, there's a capacity inside of you to make that thing happen. See, the back end of the story I told last night about going to South Africa and stepping off that plane and preaching was that I had my team of 11 that was with me. And my last point was the face of an eagle and the four faces of a man. The face of a lion, the face of a man. Uh, the face of an ox and the face of an eagle. And when I preached on the face of an eagle, I said, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I said, that's called restoration. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. I said, that's called elevation. They shall run and not be weary. That's called acceleration. They shall walk and not faint. That's called duration. And when I was finishing up my last face of the man, the Holy Ghost said, some people in this congregation need some of all of that. He said, give an altar call. And when I gave an altar call, I said, there are four categories of people that the Holy Spirit wants to minister to tonight. I said, there are some of you that need restoration, that the, that the wolf, the bear, the lion, and the snake, and the thief have stolen some things out of your life. You need to be restored. Come over here and stand in this line. Some of you, they shall mount up with we see. You need elevation. You've been held down, pressed down. And these were Zulu in nature. That's the tribe they were from. But sons of God, I said, you've been pressed now. And now you know it's time in the Lord to be elevated. If you need elevation, come to this line. Then I said, they shall run and not be weary. Some of y'all been waiting a long time for something. And God has said, now is the time. And if you know that you have a right now time, you get in this line, you need acceleration. And I said, as some of you are just going through a season that you know it's a God moment, and you're just asking God. In the Baptist church, we used to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to hold out. But I said, but you're standing firm in your faith, and you just need endurance because it's with faith and patience we inherit the promise. Come over here. Pastor Nazo, when he looked at me, people stood up and got in each line. This church is 22,000 people in South Africa. 
It's the largest black-led church in South Africa. And when I preach at this church, Pastor Nazobi, because of the size of the sanctuary, he says, I know that when people line up from here to the back of this row and turn that corner, that's a thousand people. He said, every one of these rows will hold a thousand people. He said, and when you said you were going to pray, that, that you were going to pray for them, that the Holy Spirit wanted to minister, he said, apostle going to pray for 4,000 folks? I said, no, I'm not. God said, them people that were with me got there two days before I got there. I wasn't praying for all these folks. I wasn't going to pray for all those Africans. Holy Spirit said, put your team, there's 12 of you, y'all get in four groups of three. So I sent three people over there, three people right here. Three, these were business people, ministers in our church, singers, dancers, three people over here. And I said, I'm going to put some oil on y'all, and now y'all go pray for all these folks. It was like Jesus that broke the bread and then told his disciples, y'all go serve all them folks. <laughs> y'all understand the pattern. And I laid my hands on those folks and my people. What can I do while I'm here? My folks started laying hands on folks, the folks from our church. Folks started falling out in the Holy Ghost. Then all of a sudden, some of them thought they was prophets. They started prophesying to folks, and they started falling out. And before we know it, we had prayed for 4,000-plus people. And those folks came when we got on, when we were getting ready to leave, and we had dinner at their church. I went in there, I said, how was ministry tonight? And all of them said, I have never prayed for that many people in all of my life. I did not know I could pray for that many people. What can you do while you're here? Somebody say, I can do all things. See, God will increase your capacity. Who are you? <coughs> Who are you? Ah, oh, where'd you come from? Whoa, why are you here? What can you do now that you're here? All right, somebody said, add it all, add it all, preacher. Say, I can do all things through Christ. Christ. Yeah, I wanted you to get all things, because I want you to see inclusive of everything to the exclusion of nothing, or you can do everything that God calls you to do. And don't tell me I don't have time to do what God told me to do, because you have time to do everything God told you to do. And if you don't have time to do everything God told you to do, You and I need to go back and say, what am I doing that God didn't tell me to do? Last question, and you can play. Last question. After death, where am I going? This is a question of ultimate destiny. And some people get lost because they never plan for the future. Hear me well, saints of God. You and I have to live with the future in mind. Because it's appointed unto every man once to die, and after that, the judgment. I've discovered who I am. I've discovered who I am. I am a son of God. I discovered where I came from. I came from God. I discovered why I'm here. I'm here on purpose, with purpose. I discovered what I can do while I'm here. That's a question of my potential. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My final question is, where am I going after death? And friends, that's a question of ultimate destiny, and you and I need to know where we're going. There should be no doubt that if I go to sleep tonight and don't wake up, that I know where I will be. Friends, the most tragic thing in life for a preacher is to do a funeral for somebody, and we don't know where they are. The tragic thing in life is to have somebody get ready to eulogize you and they have to make up stuff because you and I live ratchet and rank and notorious lives. Where am I going? After death is a question of ultimate destiny. I ascribe to you two scriptures to anchor us in this final point because the answer to this question is your choice. You see, Who I am, my question of identity, God determined who I am. I'm a son of God. That's my potential. My question of where I came from, God determined that before I was. The question of my purpose, God determined that and rolled out the plan for my life. 
The question of my capacity and my potential, God determined that. All of those are God factors, but this final one is your choice. It's your choice to receive his redemptive plan. You see in John chapter 3 and verse number 36, it says, he who believes in the Son hath everlasting life. And he who does not believe on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Listen to me closely, everyone. Do not leave in your mind. If you reject the love of God, you're saying, I can handle the wrath of God. It's like stepping to your parent and being disobedient. And they say, you better straighten that out. And you say to your parent, take your best shot. Some of us can't even fathom that. I have an old grandmother in my church, and she says she had a daughter come home to her house one time, been out for years, and she had not seen her daughter, and the daughter came home and lit up a cigarette in the foyer of her house. And she looked at her and said, girl, she said, no, they call them gal back in that day. Gal, you know we don't smoke, I don't smoke in my house, and I don't have smoking in my house. And her daughter put her hands on her little bony hips and said, I'm grown, and I'll smoke any place I want. I looked at the mother and I said, mother, what do you do? She said, I don't remember. Everything just went black. <laughs> and she said, and when I got up off of her, pounding her face in the floor, she said, I came to myself and said, gal, you know I don't smoke. Yeah, yes, mom. <laughs> when you and I reject the love of God, we say we can handle his wrath. Satan wants to drag as many people into hell as he can. Hell was never created for mankind. Hell was created for Satan and fallen angels that rebelled against God. But Satan has been cast down to the earth and he's trying to drag as many human beings into hell as he can. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to go. And if you'll believe on the Son, you have life. And if you don't believe on the Son, you will not have life, but the wrath of God abides on you. Final scripture, John chapter 5, verse 24, it says, I tell you the truth. Whosoever hears my words and believes them, believes him that sent me hath eternal life and will not be condemned he has crossed over from death to life. See, tonight God offers us eternal life or condemnation. He orders, he orders us death and life. He offers us death and life. Friends, there's everlasting life in the wrath of God. There's eternal life and condemnation. There's life and there's death. If you died tonight, where would you be? Where would you be if you passed from this death to life, if this was your last breath and this was your last night, where would you be? If you're not sure that you have eternal life or if you have never confessed Jesus as Lord, I extend to you the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. See, Jesus is the one that can connect you back to the Father so that you and I can find out who I am, find out where I came from, find out why I'm here, find out what I can do while I'm here, and then at the end, he'll be standing there to meet you, to grant you eternal life, everlasting life, life that's called life abundantly. I want every head to be bowed and every eye gonna be closed for a moment because I know it's Friday night, but I know I've been in enough churches to know that sometimes there are people that come to church every day and they love the church, but they don't know whether they have eternal life. And if you're here tonight and you don't know that you have eternal life and you say, I want to know before I leave this sanctuary, would you raise your hand anywhere in this sanctuary? Say, whether you're a youth, whether you're a child, and you say, I want to know that I have eternal life. Lift your hand because I'm just going to pray for you. Anybody that knows I need to know that I have eternal life, lift your hand tonight in this church. You may be a youth, you may be a child, you may be an adult. But you know, I know, I need to know that I have eternal life. Lift your hand tonight, anywhere in this sanctuary. Thank you, Lord God. 
Second question, if you're here tonight and you're not sure that you have eternal life, it's a different kind of question. Because one is a question that I know, but this one, I'm just not sure, preacher, and I want to be sure. And I talked to you about how we used to rededicate our lives. And if you're here and you know that, man, I'm coming to church and I love Jesus, but I know my life is out of short, but I want to be sure before I leave this place. I have eternal life, and I really don't know. Would you lift your hand while every head is still bowed and every eye is closed? Just lift your hand. We will not embarrass you. In fact, we will pray. Anybody that needs to know because you're not sure. Anywhere in the sanctuary, just lift your hand up. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Thank you, Lord. Good, good, good. Is there anybody in this sanctuary tonight who would say, Preacher, I know I need to change in my life. Based on what you are saying, I need to know my identity. I need to know where I came from. I need to know my purpose. I need to know what I can do while I'm here. And part of your frustration in your life right now is because you don't know your purpose. You don't know your capacity. And you would say, pray, I need to know my purpose. I see one hand back there. Somebody else, raise your hand because I need to know my purpose. I see another hand right here. Somebody else, I need to know my purpose or my potential. Raise your hand. I see this hand down in the front. I see that hand in the middle. I see that hand back there, young lady. Thank you. Because we should not go through life. I see your hand down here in the front. I need to know my purpose. I need to know why I'm here. I see your hand over there. I see your hand in the middle. Keep raising your hand as you begin to wade through those questions. I need to know who I am. I need to know where I came from. I see your hand to my right there. I see your hand there. Amen. You can put your hand down. Anybody else that needs to know my purpose? I see your hand, my brother. I see your hand, my sister. Anybody else that needs to know my purpose, raise your hand. I see that hand way over on the side. Good. I see your hand, my friend. Put your hand down. Because we can love Jesus and walk through life, and we can work hard on doing the wrong thing, and we're not doing what God born birthed us to do. In just a moment, I'm going to have everyone stand, and when I have everyone stand, I'm going to offer an altar call tonight. And this altar call is going to be very plain and very clear. Here's going to be the altar call tonight, saints of God. The altar call is going to be for people who are still searching for identity. You don't know who you are. I'm going to say, come to this altar. I want to pray for you. This altar call is going to be for people that don't know where you come from or you don't know the creator that birthed you in the earth. You don't know God. This altar call is for those that are coming tonight that say, I need to know my purpose. Come to this altar. I want to agree with you that tonight God will speak to you and begin to show you why you are here on purpose with purpose. In this altar call tonight, if you're here tonight, you don't know your potential, you don't know what you can do, and you say, God, stir up my potential so I can understand my capacity. And then finally, for those who may not have an assurance of their salvation, you don't know that you have eternal life come. When I say stand, anyone that raised their hand for purpose and for potential, or you know that you need eternal life, or you need to know purpose and potential and source, I want you to step out into the alleyway when we all stand and we're gonna pray together corporately at this altar. I want everyone now to stand. Stand up right now. And anybody that needs to move this way, come this way. I just want to agree with you in prayer. Come this way. I just want to agree with you in prayer. Come on, come on. Don't be embarrassed. Because we never come to embarrass someone. We come to help. Come, come, come. Good, good, good. Good. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. These have come because there's something of a question of purpose in their life. Years ago, two decades ago, I asked the Lord, I said, God, why is Lafayette scales on the earth? I know what I do. I pastor, I preach, I prophesy. I motivate people to go into the world as an apostle. But I heard Jesus say very clearly, my friend, he says, you were created to develop leaders and change our world. He said, that's why you're here. Everything else you do is to this end, that you were developed, that you were created to develop leaders to change your world. That's why I'm here. Your purpose may not be there, but God has a sentence that he wants to give to you. Good. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Could you all stretch your hand towards all of these that are here? God, we come tonight because we know we need clarification on our purpose. Some of us are in our in our teenage years, some of us are children, I see. Some of us are in our teenage years. Some of us are in our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. 
and 70s, Father. We just come to this altar because we need to know our purpose. Oh God, purpose doesn't come from man, it comes from you. You had something in mind before you created us. God, we want to tap into that today in Jesus' name. Oh God, reveal it in the hearts and the mind and the spirit of these men and women. Oh God, today, touch them in a mighty way. God, we pray that they will go home and through dreams and visions and your clear voice, they'll hear you say, this is why you're on the earth. And Father, all the abuse will stop because we have discovered the greatness of the treasure that's inside of us. We won't have to become what everybody says that we should be, but we can become the unique person that you designed and that you created. Father, some of us have tried to squeeze ourselves into these little roles and boxes that other people have created. And Father, some of them have created our world too small. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name that you would reveal and make it be known in Jesus' name because every gift, every grace, every call, and every anointing that you placed inside of us, Father, is to this end in Jesus' name. Father, some of our destiny is in the marketplace. Some is in cyberspace. Some is in ministry space. And some of us are Melchizedek's that will have one foot in the ministry to preach to it and one foot in the marketplace in the government today in Jesus' name. And Father, help us to get settled in what you've called us to do in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Son, the Lord has made you multi-talented and he's given you multiple gifts and don't try to squeeze yourself into one little narrow genre of life or chapter of life. God says explore all the ways of the spirit that he has placed inside of you. Push your spirit, test your capacity and move with all of those things. Cause one day you're saying, man, I love art. And then the next time, you know, I love electronics. And God says he's given you a lot of love and those are indications of your purpose. He's called you to be a person that knows how to multitask. And you're gonna be one of those people that are good at a lot of different things. But there's that one thing that God has called you to do that you cannot appear before heaven without. There are some creative ideals and witty inventions inside of you. You're one of those guys who walk around and say, wouldn't it be nice if somebody would do this? And God says, sometimes you throw it out there and somebody goes out and makes a lot of money with your ideas. In the days that are to come, you're going to write those ideals down and move them from conception to completion. And it's going to become lucrative for you because you're one of those guys who has a taste that is bigger than your cash. And sometimes you want to do some things, but then you have to check the bank account. God said there's an expansion coming as you step into purpose. In Jesus' name. So, Father, we release this to him, and we thank you for it now. And, Father, let him explore all the ways of the Spirit in the name of Jesus today. And we thank you for it now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Do not minimize the great mind that the Lord has placed inside of you. Ah, sometimes people have said, you're just too smart. And sometimes you try to fit in. God said, be an outlier. Go outside the lines, go off the map, and, and be who I designed you to be. You're one of those people whose minds is broad and it's great and you grab things uh, easily. And sometimes you gotta hold back because you don't want to put yourself out there. God says, I created you that way. Don't be ashamed of the person I created you to be. And uh, don't worry about, well, if I'm this smart, we'll ever find somebody. Because I hear this conversation where you think you'd be scaring off folk. God says, no, I have someone there and they're not going to be intimidated. So don't settle for less than Boaz. 
who is single, who is handsome, and who is rich. God has given you a high standard when it comes to companionships and relationships. Hold to that standard. Because you have gone through the worst of it, the counterfeits and the haters. Now he's going to bring in the real and the celebrators into your life. Amen. And you can praise God for that. A friend, you have uh, been asked a lot of questions about this whole thing called religion. But God has always been pulling you into a deeper relationship with him. And when you found that word, you started finding a peace inside of you. And God says as you continue to press into relationship, that the purpose that he's designed for you is going to be known. I see around you some of these that are younger that you're starting to pour in what I call life wisdom. Because God has taken you through a lot of different chapters in your life. And sometimes if somebody gets you over a cup of coffee, you start telling stories and they say, my God, you went through that. My God, you went through that. My God, you went through that. And you've gone through a lot of life chapters. And sometimes you've kind of mused in even writing a book about all these different things you've gone through. And then you kind of shook your head and say, I'm not smart enough to write a book. God has said, write it down. Start journaling your stories. Because your stories are going to be an encouragement and a road map to help some other folks through their journey in Jesus' name. And then you're going to say, well, am I smart enough to go on the road and, and to push my book? God is going to put smart people around you to help you with that whole ideal of marketing. Don't talk yourself out of stuff God has purposed you for. Because he's got teams that he'll put around you. And he said, and if you get in motion, if you get in motion, there are many people that will come to your party to help you succeed because you've been used to help other people succeed in days past. So push into the relationship and purpose will be clear in Jesus' name. Amen in Jesus' name. Sister, you're, you're a marvelous original. You're a bad copy of anybody. So, so be uniquely you, okay? Be you. And when I say be you, discover who God birthed you to be. Because there's lots of hidden treasure inside of you that the world needs now. And the world needs it now, and, the, and your presence on the earth is an indication that God needs what's in you right now. And so, don't squeeze yourself into the dictates of those that are around you. In fact, I, I saw a piece of dynamite coming into some of your relationships that you've attached yourself to, and he's going to blow them away. Because some of them appear to be for your good, but they're not. There's some jealousy and envy and some destruction in their hearts. So God says, I'm going to put the divine dynamite and you're going to find them just kind of migrating away. It's going to be like a bomb went off and all these little roaches run out of your life. And all these little parasites, folks that have been sucking time and sucking ability and sucking resource out of your life these horse leeches that say give give but they never give back and then God's gonna bring some healthy relationship where there's some give and some take and some exchange and you're gonna find a real rest and a peace inside of your soul so hold to your standard hold to your standard previous uh, mistakes and choices don't need to wind up in a destructive path okay don't, 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 don't let it stop you. Make a self-correction with God and then move forward because there are many mouths in front of you. Amen. And I see opportunities that are going to come to you educationally. And, and you're wondering about, uh, you know, money and all that kind of stuff. And did I blow it and all that? Kind of, listen, God said, I, I got this. Okay. And he's going to get you on that path called straight. And you're going to walk that thing out and you're going to fulfill the purpose. Blow off the dream that you had when you were in elementary school for your life. Because you kind of let it drift. He said, blow it off. Blow the dust off. He said, because you were acquainted with your purpose when you were young. And now's the time for you to step into it and to fulfill it. So be unique to you for him. Who are you? You're a child of God. Where'd you come from? What can you do while you're here? All right, I see it. I know it. You believe it, don't you? Where are you going after death? Eternal life? You know it's yours. Stay with Jesus. 
Well, Father, make alive your word in each one of these uh, lives today. Father, as they move in business, in the marketplace, in cyberspace, and in ministry space, in the name of Jesus today. And we thank you for it today, Father, in Jesus' name. And I bless you for it. Sister, don't be struggling anymore about where God wants to position you. I think that you have lived uh, one of those either or lives. You know, I can either do this or that. And God says you're coming into a season where it's going to be both and. There are some things he's going to tell you, do this and that at the same time. And your struggles, man, do I have time? Do I have capacity? Do I have space to do all of this? You have time to do everything God has told you to do. And when he tells you to do both of these, do those and you're going to find out it's going to become quite lucrative to you. Because there are some business ideals that you've both created and that are going to come your way. And as you begin to pursue those, you're going to find some resource coming your way. What do you do? You're unemployed right now. That's, that's going to be short-lived. I want you to go home and pray in the spirit and pray in tongues and stir up the gift that's inside of you because unemployment is not your destiny. But I do see some entrepreneurship and some business opportunities coming your way. And it's not always working for somebody, but there is work. And God wants to release that inside of you. Father, I stir up that which you have placed inside of this one. And Father, put people with good business sense, economic capacity around her. And Father, when she makes a choice, put the right consultants around her to help her to move forward. And Father, I break this thing called shame off her life in Jesus' name. Father, because sometimes our identities are so caught up in our work that we believe that we are our work. And then we become ashamed when we're not working. And Father, I break that thing off her life in Jesus' name. Father, she doesn't have to be ashamed or embarrassed in the name of Jesus because she's a son of God, a child of God. So I release your grace, I release your cleansing, and now I release your confidence inside of her. Be bold and be very confident in Jesus' name. I release that to you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And this is your day of favor. It's your season of favor. It's a new chapter in your life. Let's give the Lord a big praise. Everybody, everybody lift your hands. Father, I pray that every one of us will be walk away from this place tonight answering these five questions. Who are we? We're sons of God. Where did we come from? Oh, thank you, Lord. Why am I here? What can I do now that I am here? And where am I going after death? Say eternal life. Say everlasting life. In Jesus' name. You can return to your seats. Let's give the Lord a big praise. Come and experience transforming worship at New Covenant Christian Ministries. We have two locations. Our West Campus is located at 1760 Phillips Road, Lithonia, Georgia. Our East Campus is located at 14147 Highway 278, Covington, Georgia. For more information, please visit our website at www.newcov.org.